Hello viewers and welcome again to Discovering Truth and I am Pastor Forbes from the Gateway Abiding Word Ministries here in the Gambia. Well, we are now in part 10 of our long series entitled The Gambia Getting It Right. I promised you way back in February that this series will go all the way into May and we are just two short weeks away from that and the import of this program and telecast is the same import behind Discovering Truth, which in the next few months would be 27 years old consecutively. And after 27 years of consistent ministry, I think one should be able to understand the heart, the import behind such a program. That we love our country. Of course, we love God first and we love our country and as they say for god and for country and i would rather spend my time and my energy and my effort and my resources and my intelligence and my acumen and my network for the good of my country than burning my energy on other people's issues sometimes i get amazed when i see people run so much commentary on other nations and other nations' problems, when really <laughs> we should be looking inward. Reminds me of the verse of the Bible in a book called Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 6. And that verse goes like this. It says, being in readiness to avenge every other disobedience when your own obedience has been fulfilled. In other words, Let's look indoors and see how we can get the Gambia right rather than running commentaries unnecessarily on other nations, especially commentaries that are not going to change what happens there. And so we want to look at our country. How do we get it right? How do we make it better? One sense of joy that I have in this particular series is the fact that I can testify that I grew up in a sweet Gambia, in a nice Gambia. I have precedence, I have history, I have memory, I have testimony of how it used to be like. Pretty much the same. Nothing has really majorly changed in terms of who we are, apart from a few inflections here and there, which inflections are trying to push who we are. As I was preparing this, my mind went to a song that was done many, many years ago by two people. I can't remember the second one. I know it was Stevie Wonder and somebody else, Paul McCartney or somebody, they wrote a song called Ebony and Ivory, depicting that the two main races, if you like, can live together in harmony. And then, of course, I believe it was the early 80s or mid 80s when Ethiopia, the East African country, had a great drought and famine and a lot of pop stars, musical artists, music producers, aided by some development agencies, came together and recorded a song entitled We Are The World. When you put these two together, you can get a feeling that what they were trying to show, depict, showcase, is that we are one, we are the same. And anything that tends to want to divide us and disrupt our togetherness, our peacefulness, our cohesion, should be shunned as much as possible, no matter how novel and how great it may seem. And those songs made their millions, I believe, and I think they really had some impact. The truth about life is that we can live it on different planes. You can live life in a way where you are nonchalant. You can live life in a way where you are egalitarian. Everybody does something, you pay them back. They do this, you refute. They do this, you refute. Or you can live life on the highest of the planes, which is really what the Lord Jesus Christ, our Messiah, taught us. 
that one, we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our might. And the second, and he called them commandments, that we love our neighbors the way we love ourselves. And so when I look at my country and one or two recent events that came up in national media to the point that the the office of the president and the spokesman of the country had to release a press release on that. It 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 dampened everyone's understanding of who we are, that which has made the world call us the smiling coast, that which has made Gambia the home of many, many, many people from different nations and even different races. Certainly we have a thriving Senegalese, Sierra Leonean, Liberian, Mauritanian, Guinean, Ghanaian, Nigerian, British, African-American, Jamaican, etc., etc., community here. And people migrate as Investors also come to a place, number one, I think, or number one, two or three on the top of their list is peace. And an environment where they can live their lives, ache out a living, and exhale and be who they want to be without being rated second class inhabitants, residents, citizens, etc. And for that peace to be palpably, tangibly felt, two things. One, the people themselves must live at peace with one another. And two, the rule of law must be the final habitat of life as far as national life is concerned. And so a migrant somebody who is relocating or even somebody who wants to invest their resources for their benefit, of course, and for the good of where they are, they always look for peace. Of course, there are other things they look for, but peace and the rule of law is key. And any nation that does not have peace within itself and the observance of the rule of law chances are it's probably on the path to anarchy. So as we move from nonchalant, I don't care, I don't belong, I don't want to know, to being egalitarian, an eye for an eye, two for two, you say this, I'll say that, you say this, I'll refute that, you refute that, I'll say that, I'll counter out it, I'll rejoinder it in the newspapers, and we move to that higher road. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ taught us something very basically unnatural to the natural way of thinking. He said, if somebody wants to take your coat, give them your cloak. If they slap you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. What was he saying? He was in saying you are to submit yourself to being bullied. He was in saying you are, should be egalitarian and paying back and disrupting everything. He wasn't saying that you are weaker in any way, shape, or form. He was just saying that there is this principle of love which embraces, which receives, which forgives, and which understands. And there is another verse in the Bible in the book of Romans. Romans would be the sixth book in the New Testament after the four Gospels. Then you have the Acts of the Apostles. Then you have the book of Romans. In chapter 12 and verse 2, and you should find these things out because they'll help in your growth. It says that you might know what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. So there is like a gradation, like good, better, best, an upward spiral, just like there'll be a downward spiral of bad, worse, and worst. And our desire as citizens of this country and residents and visitors must be to aim for the perfect will, 
for that which is celebrated. And that would cause our nation to grow incrementally. That no matter how big we are, the social fabric and cohesion cannot be broken by anything, whether it be political, religious, ideological, financial, startups, and nouveau riche and intolerant behavior, we will be kept together. That is the uniqueness of our country, and that is the joy of it. And so my precedent and my history, like a lot of people in my age bracket, late 50s into 60s, will tell you that we never grew up with demographics in our mind. We never grew up with statistics in our mind. We never grew up with vitriolic religious division. No. And it is from that place that people keep saying that when you visit this country during a Christian feast, particularly Christmas or Easter, you will probably think it is largely Christian. And when you visit this country during Eid or Tobaski, you would also think the other way. In other words, that thinking itself tells you that there is the understanding and the appreciation that though we are different, though we are diverse, though not one religious expression, persuasion of faith and commitment can claim 100% ownership of this country, we understand that together we make up the 100%. I think I've said this story before. I heard many years ago that a young gentleman became stupendously wealthy and decided that the way he was going to show and declare, de declare his, display his wealth was to buy every property down an important street. And he had the money. He probably was rich in the billions. So what did he do? He, let's say the houses are from 1 to 15. He, he owned, say, number 4, according to the story. He went to the owner of number 1 and said, look, I want to buy your house. And the guy said, it's not for sale. And yeah, but I'm ready to buy it. Well, how much would you value this house? And well, I'll value it at 1 million. And he said, I give you 2 million. And of course, that means you can get two houses. You can relocate, get another house somewhere, live in peace, and have 1 million to your name, having done no extra work to earn it just by giving over your property. And so he used that method and he knocked down house one, house two, house three. He owned house four, five, and he bought every house on that block, except one that belonged to an old man. And people had warned him about the old man. And so he went and he tried to make an acquaintance with the old man, sweet talk the old man, tell the old man many things, and finally brought out his punchline and told the old man, I've just bought every property down this street because I want to own it. How much is your property? The old man said, it's not for sale. But what's the value? It's not for sale. But how much would you value it? The young man, it is not for sale. Finally, after pressurizing the old man, the old man said, well, it's just $800,000. And the young man said, sir, I'll give you $4 million for it. That's Five times, five hundred percent, five times the value. You can buy four more properties, live anywhere else, and have your money. To which the old man said, "Young man, it's not for sale." He said, "I'll give you ten million." He said, "It's not for sale." Twenty million, and then the old man said, "Young man, I just want you to learn a lesson. That every time this street is talked about." they will always say it's owned by two people, you and me. They're not going to say you own nine and I own one. Nothing will be done on this street in terms of its changing or anything without my input as an equal to you. And the young man got the lesson. And that's the truth about togetherness. That's the truth about demographics. We hurt ourselves when we start espousing and rhetorically claiming that I am this, 
you are that. We are minority, they are my majority. What that does, ladies and gentlemen, it starts feeding into the minds of both parties. One, we are bigger, we own. Two, we are smaller, we are being bullied, we are vulnerable. And that is where the trouble begins. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to do rocket science to know that a lot of the troubles, misunderstandings, chaos, disruptions, wars, calamities in our world today that are man-made, a lot of them come from this. Either religion, land, or something. Somebody feels disenfranchised, somebody feels bullied, somebody feels backed up to the corner, and people begin to react. Somebody feels, well, we are big so we can do this. We have the right, we have the numbers, we have the money, we have what it takes. We can push by our force. No. Like that old man taught that young boy. This street belongs to both of us. Whatever you do, I bought mine, this is mine. And whatever is going to be done on this line, on this line, both of us have to sit together as equals. Now that was a lesson, but going further for us, it's a lesson that if we underline, or if we understand the possibility of this phrase of them and us, will be obliterated because it breaks the fabric of our social togetherness, of our national togetherness, that which has made the Gambia being called the smiling coast, that which made recently myself and my friend Imam Babali sit together and have a discourse with our mutual friend, Mr. Mustafa Njai. And that's not just a one-off. That is something which is how it ought to be, that it what that it's what it used to be like, and nothing and no one should suddenly come into town, like what the Americans will say, Johnny come lately, or what we will say, Johnny just come, or what my Sierra Leonean friends will say, just come, that somebody just comes into town with an idea that is fighting and tearing apart and not adding to the strength of the fabric of our togetherness. That we must both watch. Both the man who says he owns all the properties minus one and the other one who only owns one. So that we don't create a them and an us. Because that is gunpowder. Brings me to a second thought that I want to give to us. You know, there are words we use and sometimes, <laughs> of course, now we know words have changed. In my day as a young boy, a mouse was and is a mammal, an animal. Now a mouse is also a little contraption that moves a cursor and an arrow on your laptop. And so words tend to be changing in their meanings. I want us to look at three words. And I want us to look at them in the light of the gradations I gave from nonchalance, equalization to love. From good, acceptable or permissive to perfect. From good to better to best. What are the three words? Tolerance, accommodation, and acceptance. These are words that may sound like they mean the same thing. But ladies and gentlemen, when we look at it within our own national milieu, our status quo as Gambians, we use the word tolerance a lot, that there is religious tolerance. There is religious tolerance. The Gambia is a very religiously tolerant country. And that's true to an extent. And as I said a few weeks ago, uh, we saw and heard and read what really disgusted every true Gambian at heart. 
and even those who have come to stay in our hearts. Because you see, some people have run away from the kinds of things that look like they want to rear their head here. You see, when you say tolerance in its benign form, it sounds good. But if you think about it, do you just want to go to a place where you are tolerated or accommodated or accepted? Do you want to go to a place where you are tolerated or where you are accepted and possibly even celebrated? Because that place understands that we can be different. And our diversity makes for the strength of our cohesion. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is in the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, the third Gospel, chapter 7. And there's a little sentence in verse 5. The story behind this is the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Messiah, was healing people. And then a group of Jewish elders came to him and said, Sir, this non-Jew man that's asking for you to heal his servant, he is worthy. And I pray you take time to look for this. You can Google it, L-U-K-E, L-U-K-E. Five, sorry, seven, colon five, or just write Luke's Gospel, chapter seven and verse five, and read from verse one. This man had come to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to heal his servant. And the elders came and added weight to the man's plea. And this is what they said to the Lord Jesus Christ. This man is worthy. And what made him worthy in their eyes, two things. One, they said, for he loves our nation. And two, he has built a synagogue or a church for us. So if you flip it on the other way around, it will be like he built a mosque for us. And the Lord Jesus Christ went and healed him. So here is a man from a different persuasion, a different religion and faith practice, but he so loved that country, took it at his as it as as his own, and built a synagogue for them, even though he was not one of them. You see, that is not tolerance. At the very least, it's accommodation, but the joy of it is acceptance. Why should I fight? a people for expressing their faith? Why should I attack a people for expressing what they believe? When I know that if the tables were turned around and I was attacked, maybe I would drop to level two and be egalitarian and attack and fight and do so many things. And ladies and gentlemen, whether it is tolerance, accommodation or acceptance, let me hasten to say, lest I forget, that it should never be a one-way street. It should be bidirectional. You accept me, I accept you. I may not agree to what you say, I may not agree to what you do, but I accept you. I don't have to obliterate what you say to make mine better in the same way that I cannot get my candlelight brighter by blowing off your own. In fact, the many more lights I live on, I think the brighter the beam becomes and the clearer falls. So when we say religious tolerance, and the strictest interpretation of that word, in my view, it's a them and us. We are tolerating them. We are just allowing them. You know, in, in Creole, in Aku, in my mother tongue, sometimes when you are trying to do something, they will, we will say in Aku, take them. Now catch, we catch you. 
Now catch, we catch you. In other words, we have just made little room for you to come inside. Don't start behaving like you have a right here. We just created a little room for you. We catch you. Some people will say we catch you. No, that's tolerance. We've just made room for you because you came and we, so be careful how far you go. No. In terms of nationhood, constitutionality, human rights, and that green passport, the pledge, the coat of arms, the national anthem, and whatever are the enshrined Gambian laws and values, ladies and gentlemen, we are the same. So in our laws, we have the understanding and the recognition of the office of the Bishop of the Gambia and the Bishop of Banju. And those are no small titles. As we have the Imam Ratib as well. So, the street is owned by both of us. Ownership is equal. And it will do us good to maintain that rather than to try to dichotomize it in terms of words like majority, minority, them and us. They came, they met us here and percentage demographics. No, that never helps. It only works for statistics. It never helps because, you know, only God knows the heart of a person. So for us to get this part right, we need to think together. And let me begin to wind up by saying that instead of tolerance, let's think acceptance. Let's talk acceptance. Let's use acceptance as the Gambian word and the Gambian way. The Gambia has religious acceptance because tolerance can go a bit funny acceptance i want to be accepted not just tolerated and i'm sure you also want to be accepted and even celebrated and not just tolerated because tolerance means that a time will come when the Lord just change and that will not work well Ladies and gentlemen, I want to end by reading a portion from our Gambian National Pledge and a portion from the Gambian National Anthem so that we reaffirm our faith in ourselves under God and give no room to zealots, startups, intolerant, bigoted people in any way, shape, or form. That we accept each other, accept each other's way of worship, understand each other, make room for each other, and keep the social fabric. If not, it begins to tear and rip apart. And as the Lord Jesus Christ said, the same way you cannot put new wine in old bottles, the same way you cannot patch an old cloth to a new cloth. Because once that integrity of wholeness has been ripped apart, everything you have to do is to sew, to patch, to super glue, to try and iron it and try and make it good. But once you pull it away, it will rip apart because the integrity and the wholeness, the the innocence of it, the seeming thread, the, 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 the continuous thread of it has been damaged. Let us not allow our social, national, religious, even political fabric to be ripped apart at torn by people who maybe do not know our history or do not appreciate where we came from and Sometimes I wonder why would somebody 
want to destroy and fight and cause trouble in a place that gave you peace and life. Because some of the thoughts that people espouse and the violence and the intolerant behavior, it is not that everybody else cannot do it. Everybody can do it. If you want a place to be ungovernable, everybody can contribute towards it being ungovernable. But people want peace, togetherness, love and understanding. So we work hard at keeping it together. And here is what some of what is in our national pledge. We must stand together as one people with one goal and move forward as one nation. One people, one goal, one nation. For if we insist on pursuing our own personal goals without keeping our collective objectives and responsibilities in mind, then indeed we shall fall. And of course, the national anthem, we like to call it verse 2, stanza 2. Let justice guide our actions towards the common good and join our diverse peoples to prove man's brotherhood. Think about this too, so that we keep the national cohesion in all ways, shapes and forms and talk and think and practice acceptance more than tolerance. Until I come your way next week, by the grace of God, this is Pastor Forbes saying, may God keep our nation, may God bless our nation. I mean, God keep us all as one. Have a good day. Discovering truth.